So if there is anything that irks me more than white folks who are equal parts oblivious and self-absorbed enough to police black speak while inadvertently self-reporting their own implicit biases, it's white and for that matter, middle-class black folks who consume hood content for entertainment. Actually, I, I, I take that back. If there's anything that irks me more than folks who consume hood content for entertainment, it's the white people who make content about those hoods that they've never actually lived in for those other folks who are too scared to so much as drive through these neighborhoods with their windows rolled down to consume for their entertainment. And I'm not going to name any names because y'all already know what their names are as well as their kinks apparently the reason why i hate it so much is that someone who has spent the bulk of my life living in neighborhoods not to differ from the ones y'all see on those hood vlogs y'all love to watch so much it's just more evidence to me that no one outside of the hood whether black white or anything in between actually gives a dog's dick about the hood beyond its capacity to be a human zoo evidently it's literally like y'all never learn like jokes aside wasn't the whole point of the suburbs so that y'all could get as far away from the rough side of town as possible only for your kids and grandkids to then blow your pension money on gold grills and airsoft glocks so they could cosplay dope boys and gangbangers at the local negro core convention life's a bitch ain't it bucko I don't know why hood content keeps getting fed to my feed, aside from YouTube having its own implicit bias problem, but it did get me thinking how and why the hood became synonymous with black and or brownness. Like, did all of the poor white people suddenly vanish like future from his children's lives or something? I mean, they have been literally voting against their own economic interests for like the last ever, purely out of racialized spite. But the last time I checked, South Boston and a bunch of places just like it are still right freaking there. But why don't we call those neighborhoods the hood? Or if they are, they're referred to as the white hood. You know, it's almost kind of like when white people do crime and drug abuse, it's not because of they lacking any moral or ethical fortitude or whatever, but that they've actually been driven to those things by capitalism when it left them little to no gainful career opportunities and ways to relieve the resulting stress. Meanwhile, black and Latino folks, I guess, just really love funerals so much that we'd rather cut each other off in the prime of life than just wait around for a couple more years for the sugar to take me and Ma and her gimpy leg up yonder. I'm not gonna lie, repass meatballs do be hitting though. I say all that to say, I want to use this video to explore the meaning of hood, what it is, and more importantly, why it is. Damn it, Clarence, do you want the ad revenue or not? Alright, so I don't know if y'all could hear me that well. The wind is really kicking up, but whatever. I've decided to film this portion of the video on site and where else but my hometown of Trenton, New Jersey, specifically in front of the James R. Donnelly or a whatever, I don't know, we called it Donnelly Homes growing up. And I chose to film here because this is actually where I spent the first like five or six years of my life growing up, actually living in one of the row homes that you see behind you. Now, I chose to film on this spot because I feel like it kind of visualizes a lot of the points that I want to make in this video because like I don't know 30 or so years ago there used to be apartment buildings across the street from where I'm standing right now and then like 20 or so years after that all of those buildings were boarded up and then another 10 years or so ago I think most of those buildings matter of fact all of those buildings were demolished and the people who were once living there wound up having to go somewhere else, a lot of them in the surrounding neighborhood. Now, those buildings were demolished for a reason. It was to make room for a different project. What that project was, you may ask? Dumb. 
this was that project. This is a trend that's persisted in hoods across America for at least the last 20 or so years. Matter of fact, the infamous old block that people like Chief Keef and King Vaughn made famous to British Negro core tubers was sold in 2021 to an undisclosed buyer for an undisclosed amount and likely will fall victim to the gentrified font syndrome in the near future. And that's the two way sort of tearing down these units. Yeah, things are so bad and a lot of them that the only real option is to tear it down and start from scratch. But the problem is they probably should have never been built in the first place. These are effectively open air prisons is what I'm saying. And if you watched either my or Feek's videos on policing and the US prison system, then you'll know that the reason why it's so ineffective at rehabilitation is because that's not really the point of prisons in the US. It's population control for poor folks. The irony is the first federally subsidized housing projects were built specifically with middle class white people in mind, and thus why the construction and upkeep was of such higher quality quality back then. As part of the New Deal, FD Hard R passed the Industrial Recovery Act, which among other things, directed the PWA to undertake a nationwide slum clearance that would free up land for private groups to build low income housing on federally subsidized loans. So basically the same way they built the suburbs, but just without the suburb part. The problem was nobody wanted to build houses in the hood because the whole point of the suburbs was to get away from the colors to begin with, duh. Thus only seven federally subsidized housing projects were built through this program. Thus the federal government just said, F it, we'll do it ourselves in 1934. But public housing as we know it, didn't really come into existence until after the wagner Stiegel Act of 1937. This act both created the U.S. Housing Authority and allowed for the federal government to subsidize local housing authorities to build affordable housing. As a result, more than 50,000 public housing projects were built in 1939 alone. Now, you might be thinking that that's where the story ends, but remember until the 70s, public housing was built for and occupied primarily by middle-class white folks. But remember, the projects were almost always the result of a slum clearance. Thus, these public housing projects were still located, if not in, then adjacent to very poor communities. It's also important to remember that during this time, the FHA purposefully kept neighborhoods segregated, first through redlining and then through public works projects. And when the LHAs did try building affordable housing for white people in white communities, the white folks with means either nimby their way out of it being built or just packed up and moved out to those spanking new McNeighborhoods out in the sticks. Because trust me folks, the only thing that rich white folks hate more than niggas and immigrants is poor white people, which then makes you wonder why this keeps happening. Actually, ne never mind. We, we, we all know why. Thus, the lion's share of new housing projects built in the 50s and the 60s were in poor black neighborhoods. But here's the thing. Remember, most of the housing projects were the end result of a slum clearance, meaning all the people who were already living there needed to find a new place to live. And I mean, there is a reason why they were in the slums to begin with. Point being, when you displace poor people from their property and change nothing else about their condition, income specifically, poverty and the crime that comes with it just follows them wherever they go. Thus, even if the projects themselves were occupied by working and middle class people, the surrounding neighborhoods were now the new slums, aka the ghetto. But still though, how did the projects go from oasis to concrete desert? Well, 
a few things happened in the 60s and 70s particularly the establishment of the housing and urban development authority in 1965 which shifted the feds philosophy on affordable housing from subsidizing local housing authorities to subsidizing rent payments for low to middle income people thus encouraging private companies to build affordable single family units that local governments had been before Basically, this was the Fed's way of admitting that the whole tower in the parks experiment was a failure. And the reason it failed was because those single white yuppies that those high rises were meant for in the first place had no real interest in living there. Because, I mean, like, nigga, would you? All right, so those of y'all who watched my How the Hood Was Commodified series, y'all remember how I said in the 80s and in the 90s there were whole ass trap houses in those high rises, right? The reason that happened was because as much as 65% of the tenements in some buildings were left vacant when white people decided they just didn't want to live there. Thus, vacancies along with legislation like the Brooke Amendment, which capped rent payments for low-income people at 25% of their income, allowed for more poor black and Latino people to move into those buildings. Thus, why by the mid-70s, the Nixon administration pretty much abandoned public housing and the people who lived there. Thus, the projects just became a human corral for the poorest among us. So, like I said earlier, in open door prison and this was pretty much the story of the projects until the 90s when hud launched the hope for program which is the reason why complexes like the one i showed y'all earlier exist today now part of the hope for money was supposed to go toward making it easier for those displaced tenants to actually afford the homes being built in place of their old ones but due to a bunch of factors, not the least of which being George W. Dickhead defunding that instead of the eagle jerk of a war that lasted a whole two decades and accomplished absolutely nothing but make the rest of the world hate Americans even more, only about a third of the people who those houses were meant for theoretically could actually afford them practically. Basically, what I'm saying is, because the U.S. is good at nothing, if not failing to learn from its own past, history has now repeated itself. And the same thing that happened nearly 100 years ago when poor people, primarily of color, were pushed out of the slums to facilitate federally subsidized gentrification is happening now in hoods across America for the last two or three decades. And that other two thirds that somehow always gets forgotten about until conservative white people need a talking point to base their platform on because God help them if they ever actually have to run on policy wound up being pushed out from the inner cities to the outskirts of those same cities. Anyway, my point with all of this is to make the point that hoods, traps, slums, whatever you want to call them, are the product of policy and not the people who live there. And that too, the hood is not nearly as stationary or static as a lot of y'all might think. Compton was the American dream. Sunny California, with a palm tree in the front yard, the camper, the boat. Temptingly close to the Los Angeles ghetto in the 50s and 60s, it became the black American dream. Open housing paved the way as middle-class blacks flooded into the city. Whites don't buy houses in Compton anymore. Now, with 74% of the population, black power is the fact of life, from banks to bowling alleys. But the dream that many blacks thought they were buying has turned sour. Though the mayor and four out of five city councilmen are black, they have been unable to solve the problems of crime and growing welfare, which is slowly turning suburban Compton into an extension of the black inner city. Crime is now as high as the ghetto. 47 homicides last year gave Compton one of the highest per capita rates in the country. Juvenile gang activity, muggings, small robberies make some blacks want to leave. Poor families, many on welfare, moved to the suburb expecting to find work. Instead, they found unemployment, and the welfare rolls have grown. City leaders have tried to stop the trend. Two years ago, they annexed 540 acres of industrial park, a new source of factories, taxes, and potential jobs. 
But there is yet another reason some blacks are moving out of Compton. Rising taxes may be a complaint found in every suburb, but Compton has an additional problem. Low-income housing attracts families from the inner city. Many are unable to keep up mortgage payments, and when the homes are abandoned, the property declines. Suddenly, the middle-class black, who moved here in the first place to get away from the problems of the ghetto, would like to move again. It is ironic for the whites who stayed in Compton, now watching both whites and blacks moving out. For example, the best eye section of Brooklyn is historically colored and impoverished. And it's that impoverished part that created the crime, which gave it its hood status. However, if you go to Best Eye today, you're more likely to see dog walkers than a dog fight because of gentrification. What they're doing is they're just buying out and cleaning out the neighborhood. And, and it's not right. Everything is going up sky high and it's harder to live. So the way out is to sell the house and they walk up and down the street. Some speak, others walk past you like, uh, why are you here? But you got the stick, man. They don't think you like a magical Negro. See, it's wild how young white trust fund babies did exactly the thing the feds wanted them to do. Only 60 years too late for the feds to take full credit for it. But whatever. Because, yeah, there are still hood pockets in bed But for the most part, it's gone the way of wine bars and hot yoga studios. On the opposite end of the spectrum, in the last like 20 years or so, Chicago suburbs like Dalton and Riverdale have seen an influx of impoverished black and brown people who are displaced from the inner city. This combined with the inevitable white flight of longtime middle income residents just exacerbated the shifting demographics of those suburbs to the point that those suburbs are now the new hood. To bring things a little closer to my home, similar things have happened to Philly suburbs like Darby and Sharon Hill. Hell, the same thing happened to Marsville, Pennsylvania, which is technically a Philly suburb, but it's literally a walk across the bridge from Trenton. But more importantly, didn't become hood until Trenton niggas started moving over there. Or at least parts of Marsville is hood. Most of it is still working class white people. It's basically like South Boston, just without the accent but most definitely with, with the racism. The racism didn't go anywhere. What I wanna make clear here is that this happens because one or a combination of government policy, private building corporations, or young white professionals push poor, oftentimes colored people out of their homes and into new neighborhoods without doing literally anything else to change their condition. The fact that your house has a driveway now doesn't change the fact that you're still poor and underserved. Thus, the same habits you use to cope in your old hood are just going to follow you to the new one, specifically crime and drug abuse. So my point is to make clear to all the NIMBY niggas in these low to mid tier suburbs having a fit about their neighborhood Elks Lodge being turned into the neighborhood trap house. That's not the dope boy's fault. Well, I, I, I mean... Actually, it is their fault. But before you blame them, blame your government for not giving them the assistance they need to have other options besides trapping and using that money to subsidize the McTown home builders that tore down the hood, the yuppie tech startup owner who bought it and the slumlord who bought the vacant house next to you and rented it out to J-Rock's mama in the first place. What I'm saying is there are layers to this thing like a wedding cake. And yeah, we will come back to the hoodification of the suburbs in a minute. But first, I wanna talk about a group of people that often get ignored when we start having these sorts of conversations. A Virgil Kane is the name and I served on the Danville train. All right, so this is Walterboro a small town in the South Carolina low country. It's also where my grandmother was born, or actually she was born like just outside of Walterboro or whatever, because you see my grandma was a sharecropper until she became a teenager and then followed her older sister up north. Now, I've only been to Walterboro like twice, but both times I went, I literally saw niggas picking cotton and living in tar paper shacks. Same goes for Georgia when I used to ride through there to my grandma's house in Florida. 
See, what I realized back then is the same way that you country niggas think the North is all just one big hood full of copies of the same nigga wearing butters and shiesties in the springtime, because I'm, I mean, it, it kind of is, to be honest, is that whenever I heard the word Georgia growing up, all I heard was Atlanta. And no, Georgia is not just Atlanta. Matter of fact, the Georgia niggas I met who weren't from Atlanta actually hated Atlanta in part because of homophobia, but also because everybody up here thinks that the South is just the same gold grill nigga who drives a candy painted Lincoln Continental sitting on 84 spoke rims that cost more than the car itself. Because I mean, it, it, it kind of it is that if we're going to keep it a buck, like Joel Taylor really kind of hit the nail on the head with this joint, didn't he? <laughs> there are several hills I'm willing to die on. The first being that churches clears Popeyes, don't at me. And another is that you have not seen poverty until you've seen it in the South, the rural South especially. Like I promise you, it is like going back to a time when live sports could only be watched in person. Now, in order to explain why this is, I would literally have to go back to reconstruction, which I'm not gonna do. But I do wanna point this out because popular culture understands hood as an explicitly, even exclusively at times, urban concept. But if you go down south, the hood is not always a block full of row homes and high rises. A lot of times it's a long stretch of highway that goes through the middle of downtown that has nothing there anymore but a Hardee's and a gas station. For as much attention as the traps and trenches get both from mainstream and black culture, the vast majority of poor people, regardless of race, gender, or ethnicity, are country niggas. Matter of fact, of the U.S.'s 310 persistent poverty counties, 86% of them are classified as rural. Matter of fact, remember Walterboro from a couple of minutes ago? Literally a third of the population lives below the poverty line. Now, compare that to Trenton, where I grew up, one of the poorest municipalities in New Jersey, where 25% live below the poverty line. This disparity is due to a number of factors, both historical that I've already said I'm not going to get into, and more recently. For one thing, economies are different in rural areas. I mean, like, what's the first thing you think of when you hear the word rural? I mean, aside from meth labs, obviously. Farms, duh, nigga. Most economies in those areas live and die by agriculture. Thus, job opportunities outside of that field are often limited. As a result, many people in these areas rely on informal work agreements to make ends meet, you know, like crop leaning while doing a few odd jobs on the side. This not only makes those workers vulnerable to exploitative practices like wage suppression, but it also makes them vulnerable to food insecurity. Because I mean, if there's no crop or more likely it's just not harvest time yet, you don't work. And if you don't work, then you don't eat. Additionally, the public infrastructure in rural areas is more often than not absolutely abysmal, making it even harder to get back and forth, not only to work, but the grocery store, to school, to the bank, to apply for credit if there even is one. Like depending on where you are, seeing a bus is like hearing the truth on a CNN town hall or during a SZA interview. It's also worth noting that because land use is so integral to rural economy, this often leaves women and children at an even greater disadvantage in those areas due to, you know, kids being kids and the value of women's labor historically being diminished along with cultural and policy biases that limit their access to land ownership. So again, you haven't seen poverty until you've seen it down south, but especially in Appalachia which I mean is technically in the North also, but my point is poverty comes in a variety of flavors and colors and along with all of its side effects, specifically I'm talking about crime and drug abuse. So as I alluded in earlier videos, I was born at the tail end of the crack era, which kind of ex explains a lot about me, doesn't it? Jokes aside, the 90s were the last decade in which ODs were more prevalent in urban than rural areas because of the crack epidemic. 
Since the mid aughts however, OD deaths in rural areas have outpaced those in urban ones, doing no small part to the opioid crisis, which believe it or not, actually started in the late 90s. But as you would guess, didn't really start getting mainstream attention until all those teenage burnouts in the suburbs figured out that they didn't have to drive to the trap to get a couple of bumps for them and the boys. They could just rip off Nana's oxys and save the trip and the money. That's that suburban education at work, isn't it? All right, full disclosure, I did build this section of the script around the fact that rural OD deaths actually outpace urban ones since the end of the crack epidemic. But then I didn't realize until I started editing this stupid video that my data on that was like six or seven years too old to be true. And yeah, urban OD deaths do outpace rural ones by like two deaths per 100,000 people. So yeah, there you have it. Point being, people don't abuse drugs because they lack character or emotional fortitude or whatever other bullshit. Reagan came up with. They abused drugs to cope with the bullshit that people like Nixon, like Reagan, like Bush, Clinton, Baby Bush, Obama, Doofus, and really needs an age cap, forced them to go through because they're too busy finding new ways to slurp rich people drier than the Sahara. So we've covered the urban part and the drug use part, but what about the crime part, Billiam? That's really the part y'all want to hear about, violent crime specifically, right? So first of all, I'm not going to sit here and lie to y'all and say that crime isn't more prevalent in the city than it is in the burbs or even in the country, but there's a couple of caveats we got to add to this fact. Firstly, urban areas due to their urbanness have a higher population density than rural and suburban ones thus creating greater opportunities for crimes especially property crimes to occur because like i've said like umpteen times now crime is almost always a matter of opportunity and proximity secondly crime has been on a steep and steady decline in the u.s since the mid-70s the reason why is not completely clear, although policing is definitely not one of them. My point is the city, inner, outer, and everything in between, is not what it was in the disco decade when it was basically just a Mad Max movie. A few actual violent crimes did spike in the months immediately following lockdown, and all of those boys and gals in blue either quitting or catching the COVID. These were armed robbery, assault, and homicide. Here's a few catches to that though. The alleged violent crime wave sweeping the nation didn't just hit the cities, but small town and suburban America as well, which leads into the whole gun control debate and how gun related self unalivings actually outpace homicides, but we're not gonna get into that. Additionally, almost immediately after they spiked, the rates of assault and armed robbery cratered to the point that by the end of the year, they were back to pre-COVID levels. This leaves homicide as the sole culprit of the ongoing spike in violence sweeping across the... Well, I'll be doggone it. Even outside of all of that, even in the alleged most dangerous cities in America, homicide accounts for a minimal, even minuscule percentage of the total crime rate. For example, back in 2006, Trenton was rated as the 14th most dangerous city in America. Matter of fact, I think the only city in Jersey rated higher at the time was Camden. And I mean, it's it's freaking Camden. What What do you expect? This was also the year that we would break the city's murder record with a whopping 34. But don't you worry, we would wind up breaking that record again in 2013 when it topped out at 37. Okay, okay, but 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 niggas was really getting out the mud in 2020 when the all-time record was broken with a whopping 40, nigga, what the f Now, this isn't to make light of any of the lives lost during that period. Matter of fact, I knew a few of them and was pretty close with one. But in a city of like 90-ish thousand people with a reputation as it has, you would think the murder rate would 
at least being like the triple digits, right? Even Camden, which is only like 20,000 residents behind Trenton, topped out at 67 homicides in 2012, the year before it wound up being rated as most dangerous in America for the first time in its history. Even the world famous Compton, California of Don't Be a Menace fame has never broken the triple digit homicide mark in one year. The most being 72 in 2005, which itself was an outlier in the decades since the height of the crack fueled gang wars of the 80s and early 90s. Actually, Compton, which is comparable in size to Trenton, has gotten outpaced by Trenton in homicides the last two years, so, yay? Okay, so maybe we should look at a bigger city like Chicago or Philadelphia's murder rate because God knows y'all don't know the names of any cities with less than 200,000 people unless they're in a rap song. In 2021, Philadelphia broke its all-time homicide record with 562 for the year, which if that were Trenton, I would never visit my mom's house again. But that's not really an accurate comparison because, I mean, Trenton is literally the size of one neighborhood in Philly. Like, how many times have y'all heard me refer to it as Far North Philadelphia on this very channel? Well, this is probably the first time on film or whatever, but let, let's, let, let, let's just move on. My point is, it would actually be a lot more accurate to compare murder rates per 100,000 residents than raw homicide numbers. And for Philly, it tops out at 35.47, which was actually deadlier than Chicago's 29.6 that same year. But let's keep in mind that not all of those 562 homicides happened in the hood. In fact, only 280 of those deaths were of black men, which is still a lot and does bump Philly's rate to 46.7 per when adjusted to count only every 100,000 black residents. The thing is, that's comparable to the rate for Trenton's total population in its deadliest year at 43.96. Yay. Again, yet another editor's note coming right all in your eye like Bootsy Collins. So despite using a calculator for this, my math was off by a few points. Trenton's murder rate in 2020 was actually 48.6. So yeah, that far outpaces Philly in its deadliest year. Again, yay, nigga, I guess. Now I'm not even gonna bother doing Baltimore or St. Louis or some of those other Southern cities not named Atlanta because if you know, then you already know. And if you don't, go watch The Wire. It's basically a docuseries. But my point is, as violent as some of these places are, they're not nearly as deadly as mainstream pearl clutchers and trap rappers make them sound. But here's another wrinkle I want to throw into this equation for y'all. For as much as been made about urban gun violence, the one thing that most of y'all have probably already figured out about it, the one element they never tell you about until they find a way to exploit it for fear mongering purposes, is that urban gun violence is not random, like not by any stretch, which is why like this pisses me off to the point of making me want to touch the nigga myself. And when I say touch, I don't mean in, in a sexual way. I'm, I'm, I'm whatever, it, it, it's hood speak. This guy is the point. A study on urban violence found that of Chicago's gun violence victims, only 6% of the city's residents accounted for 70% of those victims. In East Baltimore, AKA the hood that God forgot, only three fourths of a percent of the population accounted for over 58% of homicide victims. And in Minneapolis, only 0.15 of a percent of the population accounted for over 53% of gunshot victims. The study went on to find that across the 20 cities they studied, only about 0.6% of the average city's population was responsible for 50% of gun crimes. And furthermore, that these very small populations of people were just as likely to be perpetrators as they were victims of these same types of crimes. 
Now, for all of the hood residents, past, present, or whatever in the audience, y'all probably already know what I'm about to say. But for the rest of y'all, this is why that's so important. The one thing that all of these populations had in common is that they represented the percentage of residents within a city or a neighborhood who belonged to what the study called street groups. You know, gangbangers, trap crews, miscellaneous hoodlums, and near dwells of all kinds. So what I'm saying is... The white boys just confirm what I've been saying about hood violence since I was old enough to know what it is. Nine times out of ten, it's street niggas doing street Ew. shit. In an earlier video, I referenced an article that made the claim that most white Americans don't have intimate enough relationships with black people to know blackness outside of what they're spoon-fed by media, which I mean, yeah, you see the problem, right? Therefore, media is the primary lens through which they are informed on and therefore understand blackness, but not just blackness, but urbanness as understood as poverty, ergo blackness as understood as impoverished urbanness, if that makes any sense. That's because of the way cities and their residents are depicted in media. Look at Batman's parents being murdered by a mugger in a dark city alley. Prestige dramas of the 2000s like The Wire and Breaking Bad. Every single GTA game in existence in the glut of open city sandbox crime simulators that they spawned. Cities are more often than not depicted as dangerous, if not dystopian, to all but the youngest and sexiest professionals living in the one part of town isolated from the indigenous savages of the ghettos, barrios, and Chinatowns. Matter of fact, if you watch long enough, there's probably an episode or two that uses that as a plot point or at least a throwaway punchline. The thing is, again... That's a small minority of folk who made the choice to escape poverty by literally any means necessary. And it's usually those people committing the same crimes repeatedly because at this point, they either don't know another way or they literally now have no other option thanks to our glorious justice system. And media uses those folks to characterize all of us when that's just not what it is. The vast majority of us are law abiding. If for no reason, then we're way too over policed to get away with most of that anyway. Matter of fact, according to the Pew Research Center, when asked what is the top issue facing their community, most black respondents have violence and or crime at the tippy top of their list. My point being, whether you think the end goal is noble or not, when you paint urban areas as these violent, crime-ridden dystopias and their inhabitants responsible, even due to factors beyond their immediate control, you're not only lying through your teeth, but you're dehumanizing us for the sake of your own narrative. So stop it, is what I'm saying. Now understand something, this isn't me saying that just avoiding street stuff is a foolproof method of gunplay avoidance because like I said before, I know a few people who got shot for literally no reason than just being in the wrong place or better yet with the wrong nigga at the wrong time. But it is me saying that there's no ghetto boogeyman walking around the hood with some weird murder boner like Jack the Clip Ripper chomping at the bit to terrorize white folks and cul-de-sac dwellers alike. So again, f this guy. Now, because again, I am not a left-leaning neoliberal news network or a visual case study on the effects of inhaling lead paint, I'm not gonna leave the other 40 to 45-ish percent out for the sake of making my point. Reason being that 40 to 45 percent-ish of non-street nigga-related gun crime victims is a prime example of what happens when those who protect and serve don't actually do that which for black and brown people is practically speaking all the time. Like I spent the whole video discussing last month American policing and how it's fundamentally anti-black, poor, and immigrant among other things. Thus communities of color are conditioned to distrust policing to the point that we typically don't cooperate with cops, especially when we don't have a dog in the fight. But even if doing so would theoretically serve our own interest, 
I mean, that is unless you're already in custody. You'd be flabbergasted to know the number of street niggas who actually fold under pressure. Actually, no, 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 you, you wouldn't. Thus, the concept of hood justice pervading basically every hood USA. In the last video, I introduced the concept of hood justice. What white college students just being introduced to the concept of self-policing try to sell back to people like me on Twitter and YouTube as restorative justice. Because remember, kids, it doesn't exist until white people figure it out for themselves. Just ask Marx. The fatal flaw of hood justice, however, is that because of that toxically hyper masculinity I keep telling you pervades black communities it often devolves into nothing more than a metaphysical dick measuring contest so again if you kick my dog I must kill your cat and yeah if y'all are wondering I do have a butt ton of examples of times I saw or at least heard about instances where exactly this happened but I'm not trap lore raw so if y'all came here for voyeurism y'all can go over there and eat a bag of baby donkey dicks alongside him and like I said a minute ago this can all pretty much be chalked up to the intersection of toxic masculinity and historical black oppression that I keep talking about but there's an element to that oppression that most people myself included who aren't forced to live in that condition for too long often neglect in favor of stats and theory being poor effing sucks man like i cap you not i am at my most malcontent when i have to decide whether to buy lunch or buy gas for the week because Payday is still like 10 days away, and my last check was the rent one, and I don't have an OnlyFans to make up the difference until next Friday. Imagine now that that's just your life, or even worse. There is no double up next month because I missed this month so I could pay to get my alternator fixed because God forbid I can't get back and forth between my minimum wage day job and my late night side gig during peak season so I can get some OT hours and maybe buy the new MK on resale three months after it drops. And if y'all are thinking that was way too specific to be random, that's that's because it is. Now, add on to that the weight of having to care for a child or two or some other family member who's unable to work themselves. Don't sit there and tell me that that won't make you want to choke a bitch. And listen, I'm not just talking about individual poverty here either, but I'm talking about living in an environment where everybody around you is 30 days away from moving in with their mama, who herself is about 60 days away from renter's court. That not only makes you mad, but it makes you hopeless. There's plenty of study out there on the psychological effects of poverty, especially during childhood. So y'all can go look all of that up on your leisure. Or hell, since there's so many Kodak stands in the audience, go listen to one of his albums. Every one of which is garbage, by the way. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just playing. They, they're, they're not that bad. Still not my cup of tea, but it, it, it's not trash. Look at the statistics on IPV, and you'll see a direct correlation between not only your income level, but also how concentrated poverty is where you live to your odds of being both victim of and an abuser. The point that I'm getting at here is that this is what makes those which one of these fake famous internet white people will last the longest in the hood memes equal parts stupid, infuriating, and anti-black and or brown. Because I can promise you, we're too busy trying to survive to give a flaccid dog's dick about some nigga named Fluffernutter or Xanadu or whatever coming down to the block. We probably just assume he's there to buy drugs. Which he probably is, to be honest. All right, so behind me is Franklin Elementary School, and it's actually one of several schools that I attended as a kid. Matter of fact, it's the only public school that I went to as a child. So if you haven't been able to gather, based off of what I just said, this is the neighborhood where I grew up. And no, I'm not going to show you my old house because I am not a self-doxing goon. But what I will do is I'll show y'all some of the houses on one of the nicer blocks in this neighborhood. Now, based on the curb appeal of some of these houses, what some of y'all might be thinking is, well, Billiam, 
this doesn't exactly look like the hood or at least it doesn't look nearly as hood as what you showed us earlier matter of fact a lot of the kids that i went to catholic school with thought exactly that which is why out here was basically the suburbs to them despite the comparable drug abuse and property crime rates well that section of city is called chambersburg and it's a historically italian neighborhood Matter of fact, it's the last predominantly white neighborhood in the city to experience the mass white flight that took place in the post-war years. So much so that even as late as like the late 90s and early aughts when we moved out there, it was still popularly known as White City by most of the non-white locals. And that should be for obvious reasons. And if it's not so obvious, let me put it this way. It was literally on site for niggas in the 70s and even into the 80s, if I'm not mistaken, who so happened to wander in that part of town past sundown. Yeah. Exactly. The thing is, though, by the time we moved out there, almost all the middle and even working class white folks had already moved out to the surrounding suburbs and either sold their homes to house flippers or rented them out themselves. Like, that's literally how we and practically every other lower income black and brown, but mostly brown, family was able to move out there to begin with. And like I said before, the only thing that was changed about our condition was the location in which we lived. But it is that historical whiteness. And like I mentioned earlier, the fact that until like the 70s, niggas couldn't go to that part of town and expect to come back home in one piece. That makes a lot of people, the old heads in the north and the western sections especially, associate that neighborhood more with Hamilton Township than they do with Trenton, even though again, this is a Trenton public school. But if you ask me, even if that is the main reason, in my opinion, it's not the only one. Now there is a sizable black population out there and even a smattering of very poor white folks. But the vast majority of people who moved out to Chambersburg and even today, were Puerto Rican, Dominican, Mexican, Guatemalan, etc. To the point that Chambersburg today is the most densely Latino neighborhood in the entire city. What I'm saying is, if you want to get technical about it, I didn't just grow up in the hood, but I grew up in the barrio. Most of the Spanish that I learned as a kid came from just hanging around the neighborhood, which is why most of what I know is cuss words, cat calls, and homophobic slurs. It's where I learned what merengue is. It's also where I learned that Dominicans are evidently not black, even when they look like this, or even this. I, I, I didn't make the rules, they, they, they did. It was also when I started embracing my Latino-ness because I assumed that the Latino kids were less likely to beat my ass if they thought I was one of them. I mean, they still did beat my ass, but I don't know, maybe less if I were full nigga, I don't know. And that last part I think is one we don't talk about enough in these spaces. I'm not gonna dwell because Foreign already did a whole video on it, but for as long as I've been alive at least, there's always been tension between black and brown people. Despite, I mean, again, I, 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 I don't make the rules. Part of this is anti-blackness, part of it is xenophobia, but at the end of the day, it's just the resulting animosity that comes from poor people fighting over the same limited number of resources that the capitalists hoarded for themselves. But I think that's part of why this neighborhood gets treated the way that it does by many old heads. Because whether we, and by we, I really mean me, want to accept this or not, there is a racial element to defining what is and isn't the hood. So let's go back to Appalachia for a second, specifically central Pennsylvania. Now, if you're not from this region of the country, Pennsylvania is basically Philly, Pittsburgh, their surrounding counties, and everything else is Kentucky. No, like I'm not even joking. That's what it's called by locals. 
part of that is because a lot of it is rural rednecks, but also because of the poverty. Like, jokes aside for a minute, I feel like West Virginia would be a more appropriate comparison, not just because it literally borders the state, but because every time I go past, like, King of Prussia, that's all I can think about. It looks like everything you've come to associate with the Rust Belt and post-industrial rot. The poverty and the crime and drug use rates are comparable to, if not higher than, those further east where I grew up. Yet nobody calls Johnstown, Pennsylvania the hood, as far as I know. This despite that city of 18,000 having a murder rate of freaking 65.15 per 100,000 residents. That's damn near New Orleans level of danger. But you never hear places like that brought up on national news except to use poor people as campaign fodder. You can make a similar argument about neighborhoods like South Boston, West Buffalo, or the Port Richmond section of Philadelphia. Yes, they're considered to be rough neighborhoods by locals, but they're not ever really considered the hood. And you know why? White people. Duh. Nigga. I'm not going to lie to y'all. The original thesis for this script was to argue that terminology like hood and ghetto, even if not intentionally so, are indicative of anti-blackness, at least in America. Now, the term hood, even more so than ghetto, can be an anti-black pejorative, depending on who and how it is used, but it's not inherently so, in my opinion. Like I spent most of this video arguing, what makes the hood the hood is more than just crime and poverty as done by black people. Matter of fact, I've come around to the idea that the hood is more tied to its coloredness than to any of the negative aspects we associate with it. The hood as we know it today came about due to explicitly racialized systemic and societal factors, not just economic. Like I keep trying to explain to some of y'all, because this country literally built its laws and institutions on the idea of race being material, people of color are in both a racial and class struggle for liberation. Black, Asian, and many Latino people find it anywhere from damn difficult to literally impossible to assimilate into whiteness the way Irish, Italian, Polish, and other European descended people have since Anglo-Americans decided they didn't have to be niggas anymore if they didn't want to. Thus, even today, every single systemic injustice we experience can be traced directly back to our race. That's what makes the hood the hood, in my opinion. It's an area, whether urban, suburban, or rural, with a high concentration of lower income people who are so due explicitly to racial discrimination, systemic and or societal. So yeah, if you ask me, the barrio and even Chinatown, every little insert former Banana Republic here, is the hood. Even if the hood isn't Necessarily the barrio. Again, I don't, I don't make the rules here. Now I know this is kind of a controversial take, but just, just go with me for a minute here. The main reason why the Spanish kids beat my ass when I first started going to school in the neighborhood wasn't even because of my blackness, but it was because I didn't know the language. That's a big no, no in the barrio. Eventually, I've learned enough to be conversing, and then I wound up forgetting most of it anyway, but the language is the culture, and the culture is what defines the community's identity. Point being, what makes the hood the hood, or the barrio the barrio, or Chinatown Chinatown, or whatever, is community. The more impoverished you are, the less isolated and insular you can afford to be. You have to seek out community if for no reason than survival. That being said, community isn't something you're just given access to because you so happen to live next door. It's something you earn by demonstrating that you can be trusted to look out for the interest of your neighbor the same way they would look out for you. And if you are Latino, but you don't speak Spanish, how are you to be trusted? Yeah, nigga, exactly. There's actually an argument that I probably would have been better off not 
saying anything about my Latino-ness at all, but that that's aside from the point. Going back to what I said about the hood being more tied to blackness than poverty, remember why we are all impoverished in the first place? Because we are black, duh, nigga, or brown or whatever. My point is we all have the shared experience of racialized oppression manifested as poverty in all of its club-footed offspring. And this shared experience is what ties us who live or lived, in my case, in these communities together. We basically have no choice but to look out for each other because, let's keep it a buck, no one else will. Hell, no one else even thinks about us until they hear about our block on the nightly news or on the hook of a drill song. Growing up, I knew the names of basically everyone on my block and they knew mine. And like I intimated earlier, everyone on my block wasn't black. Matter of fact, our next door neighbor for 20 years was a white family. And the house on the other side of the alley from us was a rotating door of migrant day laborers and their gal pals. But you can bet your left butt cheek that when our lawnmower got stolen, that Alfredo kept that sandbox sized patch of grass that we call the lawn freshly cut every time he did his own. Or that I was set Miss D's recycling cans out on the curb every Wednesday. Or when our dog got loose that the house down the street kept him inside and fed him until we got home that day. Like, I remember when one of the neighborhood junkies fell on some hard times and ran a hose from his house to our outside faucet to steal water that my mom cussed him out, not because he stole the water, but because he didn't ask first. And then because he stole the water. <laughs> my point is, one of my favorite songs from one of my favorite white people music bands says, Ain't it like most people, and I'm no different. We love to talk on things that we don't know about. Again, if you never so much as spent a year at least in a place, and no, I don't mean you spent the semester abroad learning how to make pasta from scratch in Sicily, then you really don't need to be talking about that place like you know it, least of which the people who live there, because chances are you don't really know it well enough to do so. Ultimately, the real point of this video wasn't to say that the hood is inextricable from black or at least coloredness because I mean, whatever. But to echo the title of one of the studies I read for this video, that there is no such thing as a bad neighborhood. There's only a lack of resources, the causes behind that lack and the things people do to cope with the lack. That's what the hood is. It's not a place, but an experience with both positive and negative elements to it. The negative ones being those most often highlighted in mainstream media, of course, and the positives being the things that make the hood the hotbed of revolution, community, ingenuity, self-reliance, endurance. These are the qualities that capitalism has conditioned most of us to abandon in pursuit of comfort and convenience, and why the revolution is mostly limited to retweets and super chats these days. That's the ugly truth about revolution. It's not easy, and it's not convenient, and it most assuredly is never comfortable. But as a mentor of mine from long ago once said, anything worth having in this life is worth you fighting for it. And unless you got to lose to begin with, the longer and harder you're probably willing to fight to have it. And it's exactly why I've been saying over these past two videos that these are the people that need to run point if y'all are really serious about achieving any of the things we talk about ad nauseum online. All you need to do is shut up and open your fucking wallet, or at least Find ways to uplift those folks. If you got the platform to do it, use it to amplify the voices of the folks that are actually fighting the good fight. And if you don't got the platform, you could at least offer some sort of material or practical support for folks is what I'm saying. And for y'all that did grow up where and how and even when I did, yeah, be proud of the fact that you got out. You you should be, honestly. That was the point of all those dare days at school, wasn't it? But more importantly, be proud of where you're from because that's what made you, whether you realize it or not. 
with that in mind, be mindful of the fact that there are still people trying as hard to get out as you are to stay away. Not from the community necessarily, but from the condition that created the community in the first place. It reminds me a lot of when people say, well, poor people shouldn't be having babies because contraception is right there. Why should I have to pay for your nut? Well, I hate to bust your bubble, crypto bros and soft life sugar babies alike, but if you were, I don't know, born in a hospital or you rode on a bus, used public transit or held just any random highway or went to public school, somebody paid for that and it wasn't your parents or it wasn't exclusively your parents. Hell, if you ever had a nanny or a babysitter or spent the weekend at a family member or a friend's house and you didn't come back emaciated and the smelling of sweat and defecate, that's literally what communal parenting is. It takes a village to raise a child, no matter how long your money is. Your time and energy just can't match. And the older you get, especially being a parent, the more you realize this. Just seems to me that the poorer you are, the less you need to be reminded of this. Something about a lack of resources just conditions you to see beyond self and at the bigger picture. I mean, generally speaking, of course. Point being, there's a lot about my childhood I would change, including choosing the Sixers. But where I grew up is not one of them because it built the foundation that I wound up being built on. And also $2 cheesesteaks. Like, nigga, we really ain't know how good we had it back then. Get a whistle around. In every city, you find the same thing going down. Harlem is a capital of any ghetto town. Across a street. 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 Pimps are trying to get your woman that sweet. Across a 110th street. Push your coat, let a junkie 